This past week, I had my hair cut. And I had the opportunity to speak to my barber about who Jesus is. I told him about Jesus. I told him about sin. I told him about heaven. I told him about hell. I told him about my life and how I came to believe in Jesus. And then I gave him the A, B, Cs. And I had a whole hour where I had the opportunity with this man who I've known for three years, where I've been able to feed him things and tell him things, but a full hour of just going full on telling him about Jesus and calling him to believe in him. And there were many things he said which stood out to me. But one of the things that stood out to me that I want to highlight this morning was that he said this, Will, all the religious people, all the Christian people that I've met seem to live with purpose. With purpose. A 2021 survey revealed that every month, 57% of people regularly wonder how they can find more meaning and purpose in their lives. With one in five people thinking about it every day. That's a significant increase from the same survey that was done 10 years previous. More and more people in our day and age, more and more people are wondering about purpose. They're thinking about purpose. Do you know your purpose? Do you have a purpose? Do you know it? Do you live on purpose? The American pastor Rick Warren famously describes the Christian life as a purpose-driven life. And he does that because he knows that Jesus Christ has made and saved each of us purposefully. Purposefully. That he has saved us and placed us on this earth with a purpose. And in a world that is constantly searching for purpose, the only people who shouldn't be are Christians. The only people who shouldn't be are Christians. And I know that some of us are. I know that some of you are, but, but you shouldn't be. Because the Bible clearly tells us what our purpose is. This morning, we are continuing our series in Colossians, Paul's letter to the Colossian church. And we're partway through chapter 1. And this morning, we're going to look at verses 9 to 2, 12. Verses 9, 10, 11, and 12. And right in the middle of that, of that passage, in verse 10, the Apostle Paul gives us our purpose in life. And you could so easily pass over it. You could so easily miss it. But as we read the Bible carefully, we begin to see it. And, and the, what he says in verse 10, and I'll read it to you in just a moment, but what he says is that our purpose is to please God. Please God. This is what he says in verse 10, and you'll see it on the screen. He says, live worthily of the Lord fully pleasing him in all things. That's your purpose. Every breath, every pump of your heart, every day of work, every moment of parenting, please him. And this isn't the only time Paul says this because you could argue, well, that was specific for the Colossian church. No, no, no. He said it to the Thessalonian church as well. In 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 1, he says, Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you, it's a strong word, isn't it? We urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to do what? Live in a way that does what? Pleases God. The purpose of your living, please God, as we have taught you. That means the whole time Paul was there, everything preached, everything taught was for this one purpose, that they would know their purpose, to please God. And he says, you live this way already. So for those of you who know this, he then says, and I encourage you to do so even more. There's always more. There's always more. And Paul never, he never moves away from this commitment that a Christian's purpose is to please God. Because in the last letter he writes, just prior to his execution in Rome, several years after his house arrest in Rome, when he writes the Colossian letter, several years after that, he's in Rome again. And he's just prior to his execution. He writes his last words 
to Timothy, his spiritual son. And he makes a point about our purpose through a picture. This is what he says. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to what? Please the one who in listed him. In other words, Paul is saying no Christian who is enlisted in the Lord's army gets involved in worldly things because your one goal, your one aim, your one meaning, your one purpose is to please the God who saved you and called you. The Puritans in 1646 in the Westminster, the catechism said that the purpose of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Others have said that the purpose of man is to love God, love others, and make disciples. All of that is true. All of that is right. And Paul summarizes all of those things in this one phrase, please God. Please God. You glorify him, you enjoy him, you love him, you love others, you make disciples by pleasing him. By pleasing him. Now I know already some of you are like, oh... When I saw the title to the message, How to Live on Purpose, I was really hoping this morning you would bring me some answers about who I should marry, where I should live, where I should work, if I should leave this church and move to another one. I know that's how you feel. And that's right to feel that that way. It's right to think those things. Because God does have a specific purpose and a plan for your life, for you. That's absolutely right. But I'm here to tell you this morning that the only way you will realize God's specific purpose for you is by living your ultimate purpose for him. It's the only way. And I can actually assure you of that. I can can be certain on that. If you follow what the Bible tells you, then you will always be the right person in the right place at the right time with the right people. Always. Because you'll be in the will of God. You'll be on his path. Always. Because living for the ultimate purpose will always result in you living your specific purpose. Always. So how do we do that? How do we live on purpose? How do we please our God? Well, in Colossians 1 verses 9 to 12, Paul gives us four steps. We are to continue to walk so that we can live on purpose, so that we can achieve, so that we can fulfill our purpose and in the meantime realize our specific plan and purpose as well. And so in Colossians 1 verses 9 to 12, Paul continues his letter to the church And they are under attack, aren't they? They're being infiltrated, invaded by false teachers and preachers. And Paul knows that this problem is happening. And so Paul prays for them. And in his his prayer, he gives us four steps of how to live on purpose. So let's read it. And if you have your Bibles with you, then you can read along. And this is what Paul says. In verse 9, for this reason, he's just been thankful for all of them, for their faith, hope, and love, and for foundation on the good news, the truth of Jesus. And he says, for this reason, we also, from the day we heard about you and your problems, have not ceased praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that for the purpose of you may live worthily of the Lord and please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for the display of all patience and steadfastness, endurance, perseverance, joyfully, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the saints inheritance in their their reward in the light so i'm not sure if you caught what the four are the four steps we need to walk in to live on purpose but what paul says is to live on purpose we must find god's will we must follow god's will we must be filled with god's 
strength and we must focus on God's reward. Find God's will, follow God's will, be filled with God's strength, focus on God's reward. And Paul begins with finding God's will. Now you'll remember that Paul had never met this, these people. The Colossian church was somewhere he'd never been. He didn't plant it, but Epaphras had. And Epaphras is the one who comes and tells him about the problem. And Paul can't go to see them because he's under house arrest in Rome. And so he writes them a letter because of the false teaching and the problems going on there. And in this letter, Paul prays for them. And what he tells us is that he has been praying for them. So prior to writing this letter, he's been praying for them. And I highlight that because I think that's a really good piece of advice for all of us, because all of us have lots of opinions, all of us have lots of experience to share, but what Paul teaches us here is don't say it unless you have prayed it. Don't say it to the person unless you've prayed for that person already. Don't speak into their life if you've already been praying for their life. Pray it before you, before you say it. It moves your heart. It changes your mind. It puts you in the will of God. Pray it before you say it. And so Paul, he prays for them and he begins to tell them what he's been praying for. And he tells them, I'm praying that you will be filled with more knowledge of God's will. More knowledge of God's will. This is what he says, isn't it, in verse 9. He says, I have not ceased praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, why does he pray that they'll have more knowledge of God's will? Why does he use that word, knowledge? Well, it's because he's using the false teacher's words against them. This passage, again, like the passage we read last week, is a Trojan horse passage. On the outside, it seems that it is merely prayerful, which it is, but on the inside, it is also polemical, which is a big word, which just means that Paul is attacking the beliefs of the false preachers. And so he uses their words, knowledge, against them. Why? Because the false preachers and teachers believed that Jesus was good, Jesus was nice, but you needed more than the knowledge of Jesus and his will to be saved. And they believed that they had received this secret, spiritual, mystical knowledge. And that's what saved them and everyone else needed it as well. But only they had it. But everyone else needed it as well. This is the uh, early ancient days of nos, nos. Gnosticism. Gnosticism. The word, the, the, the word gnosis is a Greek word for knowledge. And the Gnostics believed that they had received full spiritual knowledge, which went beyond Jesus Christ and what the Bible says. And they believed that that knowledge was what saved them. And so Paul takes these false Gnostic preachers and teachers head on and he says, yes, you're absolutely right. You do need more knowledge, but you don't need anything new. You need more of what you already have. God and his will. God and his will. Some of you will remember from previous weeks that the Bible teaches two aspects of God's 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 will. Heavenly Father, please help me to speak as I preach this, Lord, for I need you in my tongue, I need you in my lips, Lord, that everyone hears what you want them to hear. And so the Bible teaches us two aspects of God's holy will, and that is his secret will and his revealed will. God's secret will is God's knowledge of his plans and his purposes of the 
future, God's knowledge, God's plans, God's purposes of the future. And sometimes this secret will is revealed to us in prophecy, in spiritual, in, in spiritual things, and, and in the Holy Spirit speaking to us as we walk with him and talk with him. But often his secret will is indeed that it is secret and hidden from us. In fact, when we do often see it is in hindsight, as we look back and go, wow, look what the Lord has done in that situation. That is God's secret will. But then you also have his revealed will. And this is the will of God that we can know and we must know because we have it fully available to us. God's revealed will is in his word. The Bible is God's revealed will to us. It is God's will communicated through God's words. So, it's important then to re remember that if God's revealed will is fully available to us, and yet we're so often trying to seek for God's secret will, God will be hesitant to reveal his secret will to you if you are not taking advantage of his revealed, if his revealed will. Why would God open to you what is closed when you close what is already open? If God is already speaking to you through his word, then, then, then why could God trust you with speaking to you through his Holy Spirit and his voice and giving to you his secret will? It's important, it's important to recognize what God has already blessed us with. Because the Bible says a lot about what you want to know. It says a lot about marriage and jobs and parenting. It says a lot about how you should live and where you should live. It says a lot about politics. It says a lot about, about our, our church. It says a lot about, about, about all of these things. But you keep asking for the answers to those things because you haven't already looked to where the answers are provided for you. The Bible is God's revealed will to us. And if you want the answers to the questions which you're asking, then go there first. God will speak to you in it and through it. And when you do, read it carefully. Read it carefully. Several weeks, uh, no, several months ago, we bought our Grace, a beautiful bike, her first ever bike. And it sounds nice, right? Horrendous. Horrendous. Assembling that bike was one of the most torturous experiences of my life. They said it will only take an hour. It took me three, three hours. And that's because when I got to the end of it, I noticed that the brakes weren't working and that's because the the, the if that and that was because the, the handlebars of the bike were on the wrong way around which wasn't my fault the instructions didn't tell me what way they should be put on but the instructions did show me in the picture what way they should be put on i was frustrated i was exhausted and I was struggling because I did not read the manual carefully. I skimmed over it. I thought, I know how to put this bike right. I know how this works. I can make this happen. Folks, many of us live frustrated lives, struggling lives, wondering why is God not showing me things? Why is God not helping me? Why do I still feel like this? Because we have not read his revealed will, his Bible, carefully and prayerfully. We've skimmed over how many of us have read Colossians 1, 9, and 10 and have not realized that it says our purpose is to please God. Because we do not read his word prayerfully and carefully. You cannot live on just one verse every day. However nice that is, however easy that it is, that it comes through over email and text and you can read a verse every day and it makes you feel like you're following Jesus the way that you should. There are seasons of that. There are times of that. But folks, you can't live on that because when that happens, we read it and then we move on 
but you need to read God's word carefully and prayerfully. And that may be a verse, it may be a few, it may be a chapter, depending on how long that you have, but you need to prioritize and you need to carefully read his word. You need to sit down and make a meal of it so that you are filled with the knowledge of God's word. That's what Paul says, be filled. After you read his word, do you feel filled up? If not, then, go, then you need to go back and eat some more. You need to go back and eat some more. One of my favorite ways to do this with a verse or a chapter, you'll see it on the screen, is SOAP, S-O-A-P, if we could just bring that up, which is to read what the scripture says. So pick a verse, a, a chapter, a passage, read it, and then observe it. What is in there which doesn't make sense, which is blessing you, which is helping you, which is showing you something? What is, what is jumping out at you? Scripture, observation, and then, uh, and then apply it. What do I need to, to, to do now based on what I have observed? What do I need to change? What do I need to pray? What do I need to say? What do I need to do in my life based on what I have read? And then pray it. And then pray it. Read it, observe it, apply it, and pray it. It's really simple. It's really easy. And if you intentionally spend time in the Word of God and do exactly that, you will grow in wisdom and understanding. That's what Paul says. As you're filled with the knowledge of God's will, you will grow in wisdom and understanding. The wisdom. What is wisdom? It is God's opinion. God's opinion. To be to receive the, the wisdom of God on a situation is to receive God's opinion on that situation. And so if I want to know God's opinion, who should I ask? I should ask him, because it's his. He has it. So I should ask him. I should ask him, and that's what we are told in the Bible. In James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. It will be given to you. So if you need God's opinion on a situation, on a person, ask him. And he assures you he will give his opinion to you. We do not have because we do not ask. We do not have because we do not ask. And even when we do ask, we don't always wait and listen for the answer. And so to grow in the knowledge of God's will, to find it, we need to be people of the word and prayer. We need to not just know his word, but we need to ask God. We need to speak to him. We need to have that intimacy as well as growing in the inf information which he has for us we need to receive his teaching and give him our time we need to be people of the word and prayer searching his bible and seeking his face people of the word and prayer but surely the word and prayer can't be enough surely not because if that's the case, why do PhD theologians still cheat on their spouse? Why do leaders of movements of prayer still fall into gross immorality? Aren't these people who know what the word of God says? Aren't these people who stand up in front of everyone and pray and lead in prayer? If that's the case, the word and prayer, then why do these terrible things still happen? I'll tell you why, because they do not live what they know. They've got knowledge of God's will. They have found God's will, but they do not follow God's will. It doesn't matter if you're Pentecostal, Anglican, Arminian, or Reformed. Finding God's will in word and prayer will not be enough. You also need to follow God's will in public and private. Because God is no respecter of persons, but he's also no respecter of private lives. He's no respecter of things that happen in secret. If you do not follow what you find, you will fall off. You will not live on purpose. You will 
forfeit what God has for you. And so to live on purpose, we need to find God's will and we need to follow his will. We need to follow his will. This is what Paul says, isn't he? He says, grow in the knowledge of God's will and then live worthily of the Lord and please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. So Paul is saying, you can't just talk the talk. You need to also walk the walk. And the walk that you need to walk is a walk that is worthy of God's name. My children hold my name. That means I've got an expectation on them. One, because I love them, and also because everything they do reflects back on me. So I've got an expectation of how they live, of how they speak, of how they act in public and in private. Because what they do in their lives, though I love them and always shall, what they do in their lives will either please me or not please me. We bear the name of Christ. We are Christians. And we are to live in a way that honors that name. And the way that you live to honor his name is to follow the will of God in his word and his secret will as it is revealed to you. Alexander the Great, one of the greatest leaders in the history of the world, one evening was walking through his, his vast, his vast, his vast camp, full of all of, his, all of his armies. And as he walked through, he saw a soldier on duty, fast asleep. Something which was punishable by execution. And as Alexander walked over, the soldier began to wake up and realized who was coming to him. And Alexander said to him, soldier, what is your name? And the soldier said, it is, it is Alexander, sir. And he said, what? It's Alexander, sir. What? It's Alexander, sir. Alexander stepped back and said, soldier, change your name or change your behavior. Alexander couldn't bear the thought that a soldier would hold his name and behave in the way that he had. We bear the name of Christ. Do you need to change your name or change how you live? Do you need to change your name or change how you live? And if you are going to change how you live, then you need to follow his will for you. And as you do, there will be two things which will happen in your life. There will be fruitfulness in every good work. Fruitfulness in every good work. I love that. I love that every good work I perform will not be pointless. All of you know that famous verse in Psalm 127, verse 1, where it, where it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Isn't that a horrible thought that all of my energy, all of my effort that I put into my marriage and my family, into ministry, into helping people, into being there for those who are struggling and poor, the Lord just be worthless, empty, pointless. But if I do it in a way that is worthy of the Lord's name, if I do it according to his will, then all my energy, all my time, Everything I do for my family and my church and outside of it for anyone will bear fruit. It will. God is certain of that. He says there will be fruitfulness in every good work. But he also said that you will increase in knowledge. This word for knowledge is an amazing one because it isn't just about information. It's about experience. That you will know God in an experiential way, in an intimate way. You will grow in your relationship with him. This word is the difference between knowing about me and knowing me. This word is about not just knowing things about who Jesus is, but knowing him, intimate with him, experiencing him, walking with him, having a relationship with him. And so as you grow in the knowledge of his will and as you live that out, you will grow closer to him. 
you will know him. You will be a man, a woman after God's own heart. Now, I know that sometimes in sermons like this where we're being told what needs to happen, you need to do this, you need to try harder in this, it can sound like a lot. It can sound like too much. Because life's hard. Life's got a lot happening in it. And another person, another sermon, another pastor just telling me that I need to to work harder, I need to change this, I need to do more. It can just sound like a lot. But I want to encourage you this morning that God always equips us for what he expects of us. God always supplies for you what he requires of you. God will never ask of you what he will not fund, fuel, and finish for you. Always. God loves you. God has saved you. God has given you new life. None of this is about earning any of that. That's happened. That's who you are. And that's what all of this is about. That is what the Bible is saying. This is about not earning anything, but walking into what you already have, becoming who you already are. And God will always empower you to become you. God will always empower you to become you. Which means as you find his will, as you follow his will, God will fill you with his strength. God will fill you with his strength. In Colossians chapter 1 verse 1 it says this, as you do these things as you find and as you follow, you are being strengthened. So as you do them, Don't wait for it. But as you do them, you are being strengthened with all power according to God's glorious might for the display of all patience and endurance joyfully. I love that. I love how God never wants you to live a Christian life which lacks joy. Everything, even as you suffer the most horrendous thing, even on the cross, it says that Jesus endured it with joy for the joy set before him. Even in the worst of times, God wants you to be filled with joy. And we live in a world obsessed with power. Power of position, power of riches, power of influence. But the only true power a Christian should be obsessed with is the power of Jesus. Amen? The power of Jesus. And did you know that the fullness of God's power is available to you every day? Paul said, all power according to his glorious might, which means all of his might, all of it, which means the same power that created the world, the same power that rose Christ from the dead is available to get you out of bed on a Monday morning and struggle through those emails in work from from Sandra and Paul who sent them too late and you're having to deal with all of their problems which they should have fixed. God's power is available for moments just like that. God's power is available for moments just like that every day. And I love this because God's power is not just for the works you think about. It's not just for the works of preaching and evangelism and prayer. Of course it's for that. But it's for every good work. It's so that you will bear fruit in every good work as you pray for the sick and as you make lunch for your family. God's power is available to you to bear fruit and please him. So how does that happen? How does that happen? How do we receive his power in those moments? Because I know that some of you are asking that because some of you are feeling frustrated. (sighs) Because you're not where you should be. You're not where you thought you would be spiritually. You've had seasons of sin and sickness and many other things, and you feel like you allowed yourself to go off of your, of your path. You, are, you, have, you weren't living on purpose in those moments, and you've gone backwards spiritually, and you're feeling frustrated about that. Well, God doesn't want you to feel like that. God doesn't want that for you. God doesn't want that to happen anymore. We're in sickness, in struggle, in seasons which take you off purpose. No, no, God doesn't want that anymore. God wants you to to be empowered so that you can persevere and endure joyfully whatever this season. So how does that happen? Well, Jesus tells us how. 
in John 15 verses 4 to 5. In his last words before his execution, before he's crucified on the cross, Jesus to his closest friend says these famous words. He says, to abide in me, continue in me, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides, whoever continues, whoever sits in me and I in them, they are the ones who bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing, which means with him, you can do everything. 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 We need, to be, we need to become people who practice the presence of Christ wherever we are. People who consciously know that God is in them and God is with them wherever they are. We need to continue in him. We need to be people who linger and wait in his presence and receive his power we need to become people who purposefully pray as they work who give thanks to the lord as they wake up in the morning and as they go to bed at night in the evening we need to be people who believe that a sunday morning is not enough a worship song every day is not enough. Even just a prayer, it's not enough. I need to consciously live my life walking and talking with Jesus, abiding with him, obeying him, continuing in his will for me. We need to be people who abide in him. And as you sit with him, as you continue with him, as you enjoy him, he will strengthen you. Jesus exudes strength. When you're in the atmosphere of Christ, it just rubs off on you. His power, his strength, his love, his joy, it just rubs off on you. And so get yourself in the atmosphere of Christ. James 4, verse say, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. Enjoy him, sit with him, rest with him, and he will strengthen you. And then finally, as we find his will, as we follow his will, as we are filled with his will, uh, or sorry, as we're filled with his strength, we must focus on God's reward. This is what Paul says at the end in verse 12. He says, give thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. Now, I won't say too much on this. I said a lot more on this in Daniel chapter 12 in our series before August so please go back and listen to that and you'll hear a lot more about this I also mentioned a bit of this last week as well but Paul motivates us by showing us that as we live on purpose it has an eternal effect because we become children of the Lord by grace through faith in Christ alone he saves us but our reward in heaven from him is based on how we live for him how we have pleased him. In 2 Corinthians 5, that's what Paul speaks about. Paul also speaks about elsewhere that we are like someone who is running a race, wanting to win a prize. But he says there is a way which you can run which forfeits the prize that is set out for you. Folks, there is a way which you can live off purpose which forfeits the rewards God has for you. But there is a way which you can live on purpose, which will echo in eternity and you will be rewarded forever for what you do, for how you please God in this life right now. We want to be a people who don't just start well, but finish well as well. We can't just coast. We've got to purposely run this race and so you've got to ask yourself the question this morning are you living on purpose 
Are you living on purpose? Is this something this morning which the Holy Spirit is just prodding you about? I know throughout this whole week as I've been preparing, he's been prodding me over and over again to the point that I'm like, all right, then no. I know. I know. There's a few things here. There's a few things there which could just set my course so much straighter, so much better than where I am right now. And that's the Christian life. We want the Holy Spirit to be always doing that to us. And he's doing that right now to some of you. And so as the worship team come back out, what is the Holy Spirit speaking to you in this moment? What is he prodding you about? Have you been holding on to something? Are you making a decision based on, based on the wrong information, based not on God's revealed will or even his secret will, but based on yours or based on someone else's? Are you, are you feeling frustrated and weak and struggling and stressed because you're not, you're not just taking time with Jesus? You're not each day as you hoover in the house just saying, God, thank you for my blessings. Thank you for my job. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my church. God, thank you for my health. Thank you. You'll be so shocked that how thankfulness can open up the floodgates of God's strength and power in your life. Are we abiding in Christ? and keeping eternity in view. Do you think that the things you do in this world have no influence, have no impact on your experience of the next world? But they, but they absolutely do. 